In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. I'm back. <laughs> and thank you all for <laughs> thank you all for coming this evening. This, this is very good. So for the next four Tuesdays, we'll have a lecture series on the Eucharist in light of the, the temple sacrifices of the Old Covenant. And so we'll look at the various kinds of sacrifices there are uh, in relation to, um, to Jesus' death on the cross. Tonight, of course, we're dealing with covenant sacrifice, and indeed it's the kind of sacrifice that is men- mentioned explicitly in the Eucharist, in the um, institution narrative for the Eucharist, because the cup word includes a reference to the covenant. In, in Paul, it is, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, and in Mark, it is, this is my blood of the, new co- of the covenant. So on the one hand, it's the identification as the cup, as the, as the covenant. And the other, it's the, the, it is Jesus' blood is the blood of the covenant. So they're, they're slightly different nuances. Come on up. There's plenty of seats. Sit in the front. <laughs> Don't feel embarrassed. <laughs> Absolutely. You just have to be the unusual Catholic who gets stuck in the front row. Um, so, uh, so the first thing to be said is that um, uh, that Jesus' death and its relation to the Eucharist is explicitly in terms of covenant sacrifice. So we'll begin this evening by discussing covenant sacrifice. Can anyone give me a general idea of what a covenant is? Uh, it, well, in its simplest form, it is a sacred contract. So you're quite right in your first response, it is a sacred contract. But the kind of covenant we're talking about here is precisely the contract that God struck, the deal that he struck with the people of Israel. So the God of, who created the heavens and the earth made a contract with the people of Israel. Now, the first, thing, the first thing that has to be said is, before you can have the covenant, there's a little theological notion you have to have before the covenant, and that is election. God has to choose the particular people that he chose to have a covenant with. So first off, you have, there has to be the understanding that of all the people on the face of the earth, God chose the people Israel to be his covenant people. the the people with whom he would have a contract. Now, all sorts of Jewish scholars throughout throughout the centuries um, have always pondered what was the reason, and usually the reason is is understood to to have been completely arbitrary. (laughs) There was nothing particularly uh, worthy about the people of Israel to be chosen. It was God's utter and gracious it was utter gratuity of God's choice for his people. So first off, we have to say that the God of creation makes a covenant with his people, a contract. Now he's made various kinds of contracts. So for example, you have the covenant with, covenant with Noah, that there would never be a, another flood. There, uh, and the rainbow is the sign of the covenant. The covenant with Abraham. So, and, uh, and so that his children will be multiplied like the sands of the sea and the stars of heaven. And that covenant is that the, the human response is the people have, the children of Abraham need to be circumcised. Indeed, if, you, if, you, if a Jewish person talks about the covenant, they, they normally mean circumcision, the right. But the, 
the covenant that we're most interested in here this evening is very much the question of the covenant of Moses and the covenant in Jesus' blood. So if we look at Exodus 24, verses 5 through 8, we see, And Moses sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half the blood he threw against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and threw it upon the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. So we see a number of things going on here. First, the covenant that God makes with his people is mediated through the person of Moses. It establishes a people as peculiarly belonging to God. So the people is formed precisely by the contract that God makes with them. Without the covenant, there would be no people Israel. It is precisely that God has made this contract with them. His response is that he will be their God. Their job is, is to, do all, to do and to be, obey all that is written in the book of the covenant, i.e. the law. So we see that there's a relationship between the covenant and the people. There's a relationship between covenant and the law. And there is a relationship between the covenant and the land of Israel, because the possession of the land of Israel for the people of Israel is precisely in relation to keeping the commandments of God. That the people will go into exile when they do not fulfill the commandments of the law. So the covenant is related to the people, the law, and the land. Now, we also have in the Old Testament, in the prophet Jeremiah, there's a prophecy of a new covenant in the, in, in the last days. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it upon their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each man teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. So there is the prophecy of a new kind of covenant. But the new covenant will take away, uh, will forgive iniquity, and sin will no longer be remembered. And the law of God will be written on the hearts of the people. So that there will be an uh, forgiveness and an interiorization of the law. So we can see that there is, that in this contract, there is the prophecy of this future contract that's going to be made. Now, how is it that Jesus' death and the Lord's Supper are related to the covenant sacrifice? After all, there doesn't really seem to be a new contract. Uh, and Jesus' death doesn't look like a sacrifice. After all, where's the animal burnt on the altar? <laughs> there's, no, there's no altar, there's no fire, and there's no animal. There's Jesus' death. So we have to say it's a funny kind of sacrifice and it's a funny kind of covenant. That's one of the reasons why it's interesting, it's worthwhile to look at the different kinds of sacrifices to see why it is in the New Testament that so oftentimes um, the, uh, the cross and the Eucharist are related to sacrifice. 
The first thing to be said is that notice that when Moses makes a covenant with God for the people, the blood is splashed on the people, on the altar and on the people. Notice in the book of Revelation, it says that the people are washed in the blood of the lamb. So in the same way, we have the notion that the the blood of Jesus on the cross is, is the blood of a new covenant, that it is that new covenant that establishes uh, a new kind of relationship with God that is not like the old one. This is my blood of the covenant, um, or this is the new covenant in my blood. So the first thing to be said is it's also unusual because we're the ones doing the drinking. (laughs) The blood was not in a cup to be drunk in the old covenant. That would have been a most horrible abomination. So it is not done that way. This is, uh, so we can see that it, it is, um, there is the establishment of a new covenant with the death of Jesus. But instead of a contract, it is the sacrifice itself that is the covenant. It is the sacrifice of Jesus himself, which, is, which not only establishes the covenant, but is the covenant. Notice that it says, this is the new covenant in my blood, but it also says, uh, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, or it says, this is my blood of the covenant. So it is the, co- it is the blood itself, which is the covenant It is the new relationship. So we have to say, first off, it makes a new people with the new covenant. The new people is built of the old people of the covenant, the Jewish people, and those who come to believe in Jesus from the Gentiles. So as with many of the prophecies of the end times, both Jews and Gentiles form the new end time community of those who worship the God of Israel. In the, um, in the Old Testament, we see two basic end time scenarios for the Gentiles. One is they gather together and attack Jerusalem and then get defeated horribly and then they worship the God of Israel. The other scenario is that they voluntarily, voluntarily come to Jerusalem and say, we want to worship the God of Israel. So, uh, so when you have um, in the New in the New Testament, when the, uh, the gospel is proclaimed and Gentiles come to believe and receive the Holy Spirit, then it is, it, it is a sign that it is time for, um, it is the end times, and it is time for the Gentiles to come and worship the God of Israel as Gentiles and not by converting to become Jews. So we have the new covenant with its new people. We have the new covenant with the new law. What is the new law? It is the law that is written in our hearts. It is the law that forgives us our sins. It is the blood of the covenant. It is also... What? In John's gospel, Jesus says, I give you a new commandment, which is love one another as I have loved you. So notice that the as I have loved you is is referring to his love expressed in his sacrificial death. So it's we are called to not only enter into Jesus' death on the cross, but we are to live that kind of love for one another in the life of the church. So what is, um, so the new law is precisely the law of this, of Jesus' love. Jesus' love has a personal name. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's proper name is love. In John's gospel, the father loves the son and the love, son loves the father. Notice that only the Father and the Son are mentioned, but the Holy Spirit is not. 
And that is because it is the love of the Father for the Son and the Son for the Father that is the person of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is that divine love that the Father and the Son have for one another. Um, in the Creed on Sunday, we Latins say um, that uh, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. This is because it is the mutual love of the Father and the Son that is the Holy Spirit. And that is why that, that, that mutual love is precisely what is the, um, what is the, um, uh, the person of the Holy Spirit. It is also the new law. Because to love one another as Jesus has loved us is precisely the Holy Spirit. The Father loves the Son, the Son loves us, we love the Son, the Son loves the Father. There is a dynamism of mutual, interactive love that is going on. It is that circulation of the Holy Spirit that constitutes the life of the church and constitutes us as God's new covenant people, God's end time covenant people. So the end time gift of the Holy Spirit, the union to Christ via the Eucharist and the gift of the Holy Spirit is precisely what constitutes us as the new covenant people of God. Notice what is given that was not available in the old covenant. Forgiveness of sins was available in the old covenant by sacrifice and repentance. What is now available, however, is union with Christ and the reception of the Holy Spirit. It is precisely the end time relationship with God, who is one and three and three and one, that is precisely the new relationship that was not available under the old covenant. Under the old covenant, the Holy Spirit could come upon prophets or leaders, but was not poured upon all of the sons and daughters of Israel. In the prophet Joel, it says that in the last days, the Holy Spirit will be given to the whole people. And so it is precisely this indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of the faithful that, that, that sets the old covenant apart from the new. There was nothing wrong with the old covenant. The old covenant was a perfectly good one. Uh, however, it did not give the kind of union with God that the new covenant provides. It did, not, it did not unite the people of God to the person of Jesus Christ. And that is what is on offer for, in the new covenant that was not on offer from the old. Notice, in other words, that it is communion with God that is precisely the, the, the specific difference between the two covenants. The new covenant is not like the old covenant, as the prophet Jeremiah says, it will be not like the old covenant because the new covenant will be written in our hearts. That it is will be the very Holy Spirit of God who will be poured in our hearts. Further notice that the way in which um, the blood of the covenant sacrifice unites us to Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit and therefore with the Father. But it also is the means by which our sins are forgiven. Notice that um, in Mark it says, this is my blood of the covenant, which has been poured out for many. So it is, the blood is poured out, a sacrificial blood is poured out for many. Um, so, Notice also that Matthew makes precise the case that the benefit that the many receive is the forgiveness of sins. So in Matthew, he says, for this is my blood of the covenant, which has been poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Now, what's interesting is that phrase, that phrase for the forgiveness of sins was related to John's baptism in Mark and Luke. That it says that, that John preached a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. 
What's interesting is in Matthew's gospel, he takes the phrase out of John's baptism and he puts it into the, the institution narrative. So he, he, de, he denies that, the, that John's baptism was for the forgiveness of sins. And instead, he says it is precisely the Eucharistic cup that is for the forgiveness of sins. But notice that it is precisely communion with Christ by his blood that, uh, and reception of the Holy Spirit who unites us to Christ that takes away our sins. So notice it isn't as if God is saying, I forgive you your sins. I acquit you and don't change the situation. He is not saying, I'm writing off a bad debt. On the contrary, instead of thinking in terms of God writing off a bad debt, what God is doing is he's bestowing a fortune on us. So the way that he takes care of sins is to comp- not just say, I forgive you juridically your sins so that, you, uh, so that I will not hold them against you. He makes us righteous so that sin is no longer operative in our lives in the same way. So the way in which the Eucharist takes care of our sins is not merely the question of being forgiven the sins in the first place, but even more, the death of Jesus um, establishes a communion with Christ and the Spirit that empowers us to fulfill the law. So the law is no longer written on scrolls, but in our very hearts, so that we are empowered to righteousness by this. Have you ever noticed how perfectionist the ethics of the New Testament are? Uh, Sit down sometime and read the Sermon of the Mount. Uh, It is really scary. (laughs) I mean, it is, it is, you go, oh my goodness, I'm supposed to do that? (laughs) Not highly likely considering what a, what a foolish sinner I am. So we have to we have to look at the we have to look at the perfectionism of the New Testament and say, how is it that God can say things like, "Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect"? How is it that we can say, "Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven"? How can He say that um, you have heard it said that I say? Um, uh, who, thou shalt not kill, but I say, whoever has called his, fool, his brother a fool has committed murder. Yikes. So we see that the, the, that the, the bar has been raised massively, but the reason why it's been raised massively is because God shares his divine life with us. Because we have the possibility of fulfilling the outrageous demands of the law, not just the law of Moses, but the law that Christ gives us in the New Testament, precisely because God dwells in our hearts to to empower us to do this. I'm sure that we will have questions on this in the question and answer period. Um, So the... um, so that if we look at what is being done, we can say that it is precisely the koinonia, the communion that we have, the, 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 the communal participation in Jesus Christ via the Spirit that allows us to fulfill the law and to be the new covenant people of God. Notice that this presents us with a massive challenge. It also presents us with uh, an incredible, um, uh, an incredible uh, empowerment and dignity. Notice that we are not merely children of God because we have been made in the image and likeness of God. Every human being has that marvelous and amazing dignity. What we Christians have because of our baptism is we are not only made in the image and likeness of God, but we have been reformed by our communion with the, with the divine sonship of Jesus Christ 
it is because of our union with Jesus that we have a new kind of sonship with God that was not otherwise available except by Jesus' death on the cross. St. Paul talks about the koinonia of the Spirit, and he speaks of the koinonia of Christ, and he speaks of the koinonia of the body and blood of Christ, which is in the Eucharist. So it is that it is precisely that communion with Christ that establishes us as the body of Christ. And so that when, because we are members of Christ, we are members of one another. Our fellow Christians are not merely strangers. They are members not only of the same family, as if we were the children of Israel, We are members of the same body. We have received the same spirit, and we share one soul. (laughs) So if one member of the body suffers, the whole body suffers. If one um, one member of the body is glorified, the whole body is glorified. Notice what a difference this makes if we're talking about sin. If one member of the body sins, everyone in the church is harmed. Sin is never individual. Sin is never between me and God and doesn't affect anybody else. The whole community is affected by my sins. St. Paul says this very clearly when he says, Um, about receiving the Lord's Supper unworthily. He says, if you, um, uh, he says, and this is the reason why some people have gotten sick and died in Corinth, is because some people have uh, received unworthily. But he specifies that the person who who has received the Eucharist unworthily is himself liable for the... Uh, the body and blood of Jesus. The person who receives unworthily has has killed Jesus. What he um, what he then goes on to say is that, and in addition to that, some people in the community have gotten sick and died because of these other people's sins. That their bodily health has been affected by the sins of the few. So that if we look at um, if we look at this, we can say we we never um, we have far too an individualistic a notion of how we are celebrating mass. Mass is not me and Jesus, because the more fervently and lovingly I cel- I, I worship God at mass and receive Him into my body and become part of His body, the more the more the body is built up. If I receive the Eucharist unworthily, I not only disedify others, but I literally tear down the church. I wound the church by my sins. St. Ignatius of Antioch refers to the Eucharist as the pharmacon, the drug or the medicine of immortality. What's important to remember, however, is that if we properly use the Eucharist, it will lead us to eternal life. And what happens when you misuse medicines? (laughs) They become poisons. (laughs) Uh, So that in Greek, a pharmacon is both a drug and a poison. (laughs) And it can be either depending on how you use it. So take your heart medicine in the right way and it'll help you. If you take it the wrong way, it'll kill you. Same way with the Eucharist. If we use the Eucharist properly, it will lead us to eternal life. And if we misuse the Eucharist, it will lead to death. Now, so tonight I'm focusing on covenant sacrifice and the reason why God establishes God establishes people by covenant with Moses. 
And in the blood of Jesus, the very act of offering the mass is the covenant, the covenant sacrifice of the cross, which is made present to us in the mass, is precisely what makes the new covenant people. Because it establishes a koinonia with Christ, his spirit, and therefore with God the Father. The new, the new law is precisely Christ's death on the cross and the moral demands that it makes of us. Christ's new law is the gift of the spirit that empowers us to fulfill the law beyond our otherwise weak and feeble efforts. Finally, we can say that just as in the old covenant, we were, they were unable to attain to the land uh, they, that, that when they broke the covenant, they were exiled from the land of Israel. So in the new covenant, the new and promised land is the end time kingdom of God. That uh, in the letter to the Hebrews, uh, Jesus is the high priest, not only because he is, um, he is, um, he is the one who offers the perfect heavenly sacrifice, but he is also the high priest in that he leads the people to the end time of the Sabbath rest and to the perfect promised land of heaven. And so we can see that uh, there's a relationship between covenant and people, covenant and law, covenant and land. And in each of these cases, the new covenant, the end time covenant, is the covenant that brings us into uh, personal and ecclesial, that is church, union with Christ and the Spirit. It is that intimacy with the Trinity that is the new covenant, and it is only possible because of the sacrifice of the cross and because of the gift of the Holy Spirit. And because of that, we are in a new covenant relation with God. Okay, I will ask myself the first question. <laughs> Father Gregory, you talk about grace as being so powerful. You talk about grace as being so self-evidently present. Why is it that I still need to go to confession so often? <laughs> is that a good question? Yeah, that's a good question. And the answer is that we are given the grace, but we live in a sick society. We live in... We are given the grace, but we often live in very wounded families. We have been given the grace, but we have all, those of us who have attained middle age or above, have, have acquired vices and bad habits. And the reason, therefore, that we don't experience the grace is because... Um, we have not focused sufficiently on the riches that we have been given. There's a contemplative aspect to our lives as Christians, that we are to contemplate the great mysteries of the faith. And without that contemplation, we end up with oftentimes a very transactional idea about the faith. I do X and God does Y. <laughs> and the problem is that from beginning to end, our salvation is God's doing. That when I act, when I do any act of faith, hope, or love, when I do any act that is graced, it is a divine action that I am sharing, partaking of, participating in. It is a divine action that is my human action. My human action is not a merely human action. My human action is transfigured by God's grace, his, his self-love and his self-knowledge. And when I enter into God's faith, hope, and love, it is the theological virtues, which are not merely human actions, but are human actions caught up into the very life of God, that it's these actions that make a difference in the world. When St. Therese, the little flower, talks about doing the littlest thing in love, what she's talking about is saying that if we do the littlest thing, but we do it transfigured by God's love, 
then the world is tra transformed, transfigured and changed. That we don't have to be doing great things. We don't have to be doing uh, marvels or, um, or great conquests. On the contrary, even the smallest things of our day can become heroic and, and divine by doing them in faith, hope, and love. And so what I would say would be the reason why I continue to sin is I forget about God. The more I contemplate God, the more I recognize the, 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 immense, the immensity of the grace that he has poured out into my heart, then, uh, then I am not going to be sinning. When I recognize my dignity as a Christian, that God has done so much for me, his son died for me and for us. And it's that that is the reason that we, if we contemplate these things, part of the problem is we just take, take our faith for granted. We don't, um, we don't uh, pause and think of the reason why I do these things is because I'm surrounded by bad examples, I've got bad habits, and I need to get out of them. But we are empowered to change. I say this because myself, I mean, I was hospitalized for chronic depression and anxiety. And my own experience was that I, um, I was unable to accept that God could work miracles in my life. I saw God working miracles in other people's lives from my preaching, from my teaching, from the confessional ministry. I saw miracles all the time. There wasn't, I had no problem with, with the idea that God works miracles. It's just it never occurred to me that God could work a miracle in my life. And once I had that hope, then I became empowered to change. Now, I'm not suggesting that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm that terrific a human being. What I'm suggesting is that um, I'm on the way to the transformation of grace. And it's that, it's that is the most important. We have, to grow in, we have to grow in grace just as we have to grow in maturity. I have to grow up as a human being and I need to grow up as a Christian. And so part of that maturing, part of that growing up is growing in the grace to learn to love as Christ is loved. One of, the, one of the things that is so, um, I think one of the things that is um, so common and the reasons why people c continue to have such a hard time uh, with, with habitual sins is judgment of others and lack of forgiveness. And I say this because these are the things that are most enslaving in our spiritual lives. Um, the spiritual life of the Christian is to grow in freedom, in the spiritual freedom, so that I can love with God's own love. That's the entirety of the Christian life. And the problem is, is that I, don't, I need to fight for freedom. And one of the primary ways I can do that is not judging others and forgiving, uh, forgiving other people. Because without those things, I'm living in the evil done to me in the past. And I'm not living in the possibilities for love in the present and the future. And uh, so um, uh, judgment hurts me. Um, Grudges and resentment and, um, and not forgiving hurt me. They don't hurt anybody else. And the biggest th way they hurt me is I am unfree because I have not conquered the evil with good, but rather I've allowed the good to conquer me, the evil to conquer me. Um, so I've asked myself my, the first question, are there other questions? <laughs> she said she said it's a good thing I asked uh, somebody asked me that question because my answer was good okay yes so, um, you said that, um, that 
Well, the specific community means the whole body of everybody, all Christians. I mean, also, I mean, um, a vibrant, a vibrant community that is growing in grace is going to be uh, an easier place where it is where we can grow in virtue. If you're surrounded by virtuous people, it's going to be easier to grow in virtue. I mean, that's just, that's just um, simple sociology. I mean, it's. So, uh, so the local community is if if you if you're living in a local community that it, it that is fervent, devout, growing in virtue, and growing in faith, hope, and love, then it's going to be e- easier to grow in virtue yourself. So, uh, so, um, uh, but I wouldn't say that it's necessarily that it only affects the local community. It affects the whole body of the church throughout the world. Notice also what I'm saying is look at, look at the places in the world where Christians are being persecuted. There are people who are being martyred for their faith uh, this very moment. And we don't wake up and smell the coffee. And I include myself in that. I'm not pointing my finger at anybody there. Yeah, Bob? I am. Do I understand you to be judging people rather than when I see evil in the world, like the martyrdom of Christians, what kind of judgment, if any, am I called upon to render? What okay. The question the question is um, he's basically pointing out there's a judgment there's a difference between judging an act and judging a person. The kind of judgment that we are forbidden to do is judging persons. Because the measure we measure to other people is measured to us. Judge not, lest you be judged. The measure you measure to others will be the measure you receive. So judgment of persons is forbidden. We are not to judge persons. We, of course, have to judge actions. There are actions that are bad and there are actions that are good. On the other hand, I can only see the exteriority of the act. I cannot see the, the heart of the person in question, so I, don't, I cannot judge the gravity of the sin or the culpability or other things. So um, there can be all sorts of diminishment of, of freedom and other things that might be involved in the case that I can't see. I can also misperceive things very easily. So I might perceive things uh, without having all of the facts of the case. So what I would say is, of course, we judge actions. We, we hate the sin and we love the sinner. Uh, also, notice it ain't over till the fat lady sings. <laughs> we can judge somebody as a most horrible sinner on the face of the planet, and they might, might end up being the greatest saint there is. St. Paul, when he was approving of the, uh, of the stoning of Stephen, didn't look very good. He looked pretty bad. Uh, when he was br- uh, breathing murderous threats, he didn't look very good. But then again, God made him an, uh, uh, a vessel of election for uh, an apostle to the Gentiles. So we have to say we don't know what God has in store for the person that we're judging as a sinner. We can say that person is worse than a sinner than possible, um, but but you know that person might be a, a much better, greater saint in heaven than I will be. Notice that um, we are to love one another as God has loved us, and that does mean that we are to first off love uh, those the household of faith first. But we are also called on to love those who do not belong to the household of faith, because they might. <laughs> When, when the fat lady sings, they might be in heaven. So in a very real sense, my loving them now makes it far more possible for them to become great saints than my condemning and judging them. I think it's very clear that we have to make distinctions and say certain actions are sinful, absolutely. But we also have to say, um, I, I don't have the right to judge someone else. And indeed, judgment of someone else hurts me 
because I am putting a limitation on God's charity in my life. By simply saying that person is a sinner, um, I've, I've cut that person off from the divine love that I have to have for them. Instead of saying that person, that person has the potential of being a great saint and therefore is lovable because of that potential. Actually, if you look at if you look at covenant fidelity in the Old Testament, uh, it's God who's the one who's faithful. Israel, <laughs> Israel isn't particularly faithful, and that's not saying anything bad about Israel. It's just saying that God is is God does more than keep his side of the bargain, and so so yeah, but he uses the vehicle as the means by which he does that. Yeah, and I think that I think that. Uh, his covenant fidelity is as much in relation to his choice of a people than that we really can't separate the covenant from election. Covenant and election go hand in hand. I'm sorry, when St. Paul says, like, uh, I don't, don't pass judgment on anyone, but I don't even pass judgment on myself. Right. That's part of what it means. But, but the thing is that, that when I recognize my sins, I have to also have a firm amendment of life. And part of the firm amendment of life is, in practical terms, being able to say, what are those concrete steps that I'm going to take to get out of the bad habits I have? Habits are the stuff of morality. Morality is about habits. So there are bad habits that diminish our freedom and there are good habits that increase our freedom. And so so the way that you get into any habit is consciously making a choice to do something that's either good or bad. When we, we get into a bad habit, we consciously choose to do the individual acts until our freedom is diminished, so doing the right thing becomes difficult. When we consciously develop a virtue, we consciously do the good acts that give us the, the, the habit of doing the right thing. And therefore, we are able to do things that when we were trapped in the vice, we wouldn't have been able to do. And so we are given greater freedom. No virtue will take away our possibility of, of doing wrong. <laughs> But we don't lose that freedom, unfortunately, this side of heaven. But at the same time, we um, uh, there's the virtues and the vices. We have to we have to grow in the virtues and uh, dig our way out of the hole we've dug for ourselves of the vices. And that's only one choice at a time. Yeah, um, you said that you don't really understand something until you've been articulated to someone else. And I've been a Catholic for you know, 72 years. I guess was that time. So I've been living in the dynamic that you've been talking about. But at the same time, I, I doubt very much that I could go home and say to my wife, you know, articulate to her the kinds of things that we're talking about tonight. I, what I want to know is how will a Christian come to that kind of understanding? I mean, you know, when I went through Catholic high school and all that, right. Um, part, of it, part of it is a matter of doing the theology, but part of it is also um, doing the prayer and the moral struggle. 
and to recognize that God is powerful and he provides the Holy Spirit when I need the Holy Spirit. And so, I mean, that's what I think, that's what I would hope you would be able to articulate your, to your wife when you go home is to say that you have a, a renewed, uh, a renewed um, vision of the possibility for sainthood for yourself because God's spirit is powerful. Well, what I mean is, I would like to be able to articulate about the, co- the old covenant. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, books. I mean, programs. Uh, yeah, books and books and reflecting on things. Um, just simply noticing how odd that the new covenant language is so in the New Testament. The primary place you find it is in the Eucharist, and in particular with the cup of the blood. The cup of the blood is the new covenant um, center of gravity in the New Testament. The new covenant is mentioned in a few other places. Paul can, Paul can use it uh, polemically and, and other things. But the primary place where you have new covenant language in the New Testament is precisely the cup of the blood. And it's the cup that is the new covenant in, uh, in Christ's blood or is Christ's blood of the new covenant. So it's it, the it's um, at how and how odd that sounds when you think of what the covenant the covenant with Moses with the book of the covenant etc cetera, etc. Cetera. It just uh, this bloody sacrifice is the covenant. Well, here's some books you can recommend that a person could read to get into this. No. <laughs> um, there's. Um, there's not one book. There's a whole series of books and things. When I ever get around to writing the book that I'm supposed to be writing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Did, did people hear what you were saying? I think that there's a. I think that the, the the thing that you said best is reading scripture as if for the first time. You know, when we hear the scriptures in church, I do this, so I know you do. Um, the scripture begins, and I say, "Oh, it's that story." Click. <laughs> uh, it's heard that one, been there, done that, bought the T-shirt. Don't have to listen anymore. And the thing is that that is such a natural thing to do because we are familiar with the texts, but we're not as familiar with the text as we think we are. <laughs> so the reality is, is that it's important for us to try to read the texts with new eyes and not with, because it is, it is nearly impossible to read the, the scriptures without every sermon we have ever heard. Because we hear the sermons we've heard on everything, and sermons tend to moralize. Moralizing is what sermons do. Do X and avoid Y. You know, that's what sermons do. And you're just going, many of the stories in the scriptures aren't about moralism. And you go, you're moralizing stories that are about Jesus' divinity and not about being a good little boy or girl. And uh, so it's... uh, So it's... uh, it's we also have to we have to turn off every sermon we have ever heard or every prejudice we have already about the text. Uh, I think that actually you.
Okay, there, there are a couple things that you've been talking about here. The first thing is that I'm ta- the receiving unworthily, we're talking about mortal sin here. We're talking about the kind of sin that chases the Holy Spirit out of your soul, that kills charity. That's the kind of sin we're talking about, a mortal sin. The second, so we're not talking about venial sins. Uh, we're not talking about imperfections. We're talking about mortal sin. And to, to have a mortal sin, it has to be something that is truly um, gravely wrong. You have to know it's wrong, and you have to freely choose it. Right? So that's what makes a mortal sin. Secondarily, you, you brought up the issue of emotions. Emotions are neither good nor bad. Emotions are just emotions. They're not morally good or bad. What is good or bad is what I choose to do in the light of my emotion. So it is my choice that is morally good or bad. My emotion is not that. Say I find somebody irritating and I have a spontaneous thought that I'd like to choke them. (laughs) That is a spontaneous thought and I did not choose this. I did not choose this thought. It is not a morally bad thought. If I follow through on this random thought and choke the person, that is wrong. Um, so, uh, so random thoughts or emotions are not in themselves the problem. There are wrong thoughts and there are wrong desires. And they become wrong precisely when I choose to cultivate them. They're not wrong in their genesis. They're wrong only if I choose to cultivate them. But even cultivating them is not as bad as doing them. <laughs> so, um, so, um, so it's the first thing is emotions by themselves are not that. Secondarily, with anger, it's important to say there's the anger that, that is a sin and there's anger that is not a sin. God put God put anger, just as God put desire, built into human beings for a reason. The reason that anger is built into us is twofold. We need a fight or flight mechanism. There are situations where I need to um, stop an injustice or right a wrong. For example, If I see uh, an adult man beating up on a little girl on the street, if I don't get angry, there's something wrong. But that anger is to energize me to stop the injustice. And so if I follow through on that, then the anger has done its job properly. But it also needs to be in proportion to the injustice, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The problem is is that my perceptions can be wrong, so I can perceive injustices that aren't there. He looked at me the wrong way. (laughs) She really hates me. Uh, We can misperceive things, and so the injustices aren't real injustices. We can also overreact to things, and overreacting is usually because there's something else bothering me, but I'm taking it out on the other person. So, um, so So there's ways in which anger can go askew. But also, fundamentally, if anger can't follow through and do its job properly, if I can't change the situation that is causing the anger, then I have to forgive the person or the situation and accept the situation. If I don't, the anger poisons my life and makes me, makes the evil done to control my life. And Uh, I can't let the evil that is done to me control my life. Uh, Because if I do, I'm not going to have the spiritual freedom to love that I need to have. So anger anger is, when anger is is based on unrealities, or when anger is out of proportion to the reality, um, it, it is wrong, it is evil. Now, We're all better off if we could live serene, calm, peaceful lives without anger. But that's because there's so much in our society that 
that's frankly, it would be, it's hard not to get angry. But you notice the things that people mostly get angry about? Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's been a week since my last confession. I curse when I'm driving. (laughs) Yes, I've heard this before. Uh, uh, But, so before you even get in the car, cultivate serenity. (laughs) Say the serenity prayer before you get in the car. Oh, okay. (laughs) Uh Uh-oh, (laughs) uh-oh. Well, you know that... You know, you know the, you know the, you know the story about the taxi driver and the priest who get to heaven. <laughs> yeah, the taxi driver and the priest get to heaven at the same time, and the taxi driver is shown into this beautiful mansion with all the appointments and all the luxuries and everything. And the priest is given this little, uh, little, um, little hovel, and the priest says, "I'm a priest. Why did I get this little hovel?" And he gets, he says. Everybody fell asleep during your homilies, but everybody was awake and praying when they rode in his taxi. <laughs> okay, but anyway, so. I was wondering why God chose to use blood in the covenant. So, for, so you know, there's the covenant in his blood, and then before then, all the covenants before then, you know, Moses, there's the bowls of the... Abraham, there's the slaughtered animals. So why would God choose blood as the medium? There's a little line in Leviticus, for the blood is the life. But, but again, um, uh, so but why would God, God choose Okay, Okay, because God's a drama queen? No. <laughs> uh, d- no, it's that it's the sorry that no it's that um uh i don't know uh, all right okay Well, right, right. But I, th- I think I think it's because it's it blood blood is such an obvious sign of life that if you bleed you die, and so I think that the blood is is just a, a very po- powerful symbol of of life. Remember in the old covenant, the blood had to be drained from animals before you could eat them, because you were not to eat the blood, you were not to drink the blood of animals. Uh, and because it was a life, and the life belongs to God, so um, so there's so there's that. Um, um, so I, I think that there, that's part of it. Yeah. There's someone over here. Yes. Uh, okay. Okay. What I'm saying is this is Paul's argument. Right. I'm not suggesting that this happens. I'm just saying this is Paul's this is Paul's idea, and it, he he would say that other people fell sick in the community. What I'm arguing is that the, there are effects of my sin on the whole community. Apparently because he specifies that the person in, in question is the person who's received unworthily has is liable for the body and blood. Of, and he says, and that is why some people in the community have gotten sick and died. It certainly sounds like he's talking about people who are not liable, but rather other people. 
Um, and the thing is that we're talking about um, we're talking about uh, that the sin is 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 a is a communal sin and not just an individual sin. I mean, I think I think it's a it's a it's a corollary to um, what Paul says in relation to um, we are members of one another. Okay. Oh, yes. Yes, uh, addiction addiction is one way of speaking of this. But even even without that, uh, when you because even before that there's abuse, and even with abuse there's diminished freedom. So really, it's it's far more of a question of diminishment of freedom rather than than totally getting rid of freedom. Because uh, even an addict can can get into recovery in the 12 steps or make choices, life choices that the person might be powerless over the addiction, but that doesn't mean that they, they can't cultivate freedom in the rest of their life to the point that they become the kind of people who don't need to pick up a drink or engage in compulsive sex or, or gamble or whatever. So, um, so, um, so if you look at, if you, uh, but the virtues and the vices are just um, the ancient way of looking at, at morals. The rule-based system is, is important. Rules are, are useful. But um, far more important than rules are um, the whether you're growing or you're withering. <laughs> It's the, the organic language, the growth in virtue and the habits is far more um, humanely accurate, I think. The problem with the problem with rules is you either follow the rules or you don't follow the rules. You're either in or you're out. Um, whereas if you if you're virtue based, um, you can say even if you're not following the rules, you can grow to the point where you do follow them. And even if you're following the rules, you still need to grow. <laughs> So um, the the good thing about the 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 virtue based uh, morality is you can't sit sit back and say I've got it done I've got it figured out it, there's nothing left to do um, and also there's hope for the sinner because the sinner can say I can grow to that point there isn't there isn't a point where I can't grow to do that it isn't impossible because I can grow to become the kind of person who can follow the rules. So it's just that following the rules, if that's... The problem, of course, is that when you deal with children, you have to give them rules. How do you teach children without rules? You, you need rules when you're talking to kids. The problem is, is that after childhood, people stop listening to, to, to things that have to do with the faith. Um, because they say, well... Um, the church was wrong because of what sister so-and-so taught me when I was 10 years old. And you go, if you have a 10-year-old understanding of the faith and you're 50, there's something wrong here. <laughs> uh, this is, you might have an inadequate notion of what the faith actually is. And so, so, um, so the, the, you have to teach rules to kids. And so, so much of our times, and as, um, and frankly, the age of reason is usually in the mid 30s to the mid 40s. <laughs> and so, I mean, so most of most of us need the rules for a good bit of our lives. And so, so anyway, okay. Well, I'm beat, and I'll see you all next Tuesday. Thank you very much.